Episode 10, The Neuroscience of Influence and Persuasion Through Storytelling. In their 2007 book, Made to Stick, Why Some Ideas Survive and Others Die, Chip and Dan Heath made an interesting point. They say, quote, stories are like flight simulators for the brain. The right kind of story is effectively a simulation. Mental simulation is not as good as actually doing something but it's the next best thing, end quote. I want you to keep that concept in mind as we talk about what ideas stick and why, that stories are like flight simulators for the brain. Because in this episode, we're going to explore the brain science, neuroscience research that's been conducted over the years into why stories are more effective at getting your ideas to stick versus simply providing a logical explanation backed up with facts and data. They go on to say, quote, brain scans show that when people imagine a flashing light, they activate the visual area of the brain. When they imagine someone tapping on their skin, they activate tactile areas of the brain. People who imagine looking up at the Eiffel Tower can't resist moving their eyes upward, end quote. So here's the thing, in order to feel confident that the story you wanna tell is going to work, that it's going to grab people's attention and persuade them to come over to your point of view, it's helpful to understand what's going on inside the heads of the people staring back at you while you're telling your story. Because in my experience, people's faces and body language don't always give you the feedback you need in real time. They don't always look engaged. I don't know about you, but it took me many, many presentations to finally stop interpreting what was going on in someone's head while I was telling my story based on their facial expressions and body language. What I discovered was what looked like a room full of blank faces or worse, bored faces actually turned out to be people who were listening intently, who weren't just listening, but were actually hyper engaged. Their brains were firing on all cylinders. They were watching the movie of my story in their minds. And, and what blew me away was what they told me after my speech, that they were experiencing their own story, their own movie during my story simultaneously. They didn't know that they looked bored or disinterested. They were busy having an auditory, visual, and kinesthetic experience. They were watching a simulation of my story, which caused them to see it, feel it, and in some cases, physically experience it. Welcome to the Storytelling That Sticks for Business and Life 20-Minute Podcast. I'm your host and story coach, Doug Stevenson. In this podcast series, I'm going to share with you practical storytelling hacks, techniques, and holistic approaches that will make your stories stick. Stories that sell you and your product or service. Now, if you feel like you learned something valuable today, please click on the follow or subscribe button. Here's a preview of what you're going to learn in this episode the brain science that explains why stories stick, research from various sources explaining the changes in brain chemistry of your listener while you're telling your story, and why facts and data alone fail to trigger the same level of mental engagement as a simple story. All right, let's get into it. When I began my professional speaking career back in the 90s, I told some really good stories. Now, because I'd been trained as an actor, I knew how to be funny and emotionally engaging, how to use comedy and drama, volume and silence, movement and gesture, and staging to make my stories come alive. I knew my stories worked because people hired me on the basis of my stories, literally. But what I didn't know at the time was that there was a new body of research into adult learning, how the brain worked to retain information, how facts and data were great, but they weren't engaging or memorable. So all of a sudden, all these books start coming out in the early 2000s, talking about the power and effectiveness of stories, not only to engage attention and enhance retention, but to influence and persuade and sell, to make people more effective leaders, managers, and salespeople. 
Now, one of the first of these books that gained national attention was titled A Whole New Mind, Why Right Brainers Will Rule the Future. In his book, Daniel Pink states, quote, stories are easier to remember because they are how we remember. They represent a pathway to understanding that doesn't run through the left side of the brain. In his view, the future belongs to the big picture thinkers, the storytellers. He goes on to say, when facts become so widely available and instantly accessible, each one becomes less valuable. What begins to matter more is the ability to place these facts in context and to deliver them with emotional impact, end quote. That was my first clue why my stories worked. The emotional impact. My stories made people laugh and cry. They took people on an emotional roller coaster, just like a good movie. And what started to happen more and more as I shifted from being a keynote speaker and storyteller to a story teacher and trainer in corporations was that the logical left brain thinkers, the engineers who loved facts and data, they wanted scientific proof as to why stories work. So I started to read more and do more research. And what I found, interestingly enough, was research from a whole bunch of left brain thinkers who found themselves being captivated by a good story. And they wanted to know why, why scientifically, why brain science, why storytellers got them so engaged and all of their facts and data just fell flat. I wanna illustrate a real world example of how stories are flight simulators for the brain. Now there's a scene in my airport story, and you might remember that from episode two, the one with the look for the limo as a tagline, where I'm running late to get to my after dinner keynote speech in Kansas City. My connecting flight was delayed in Chicago, and we'd finally landed at the airport in Kansas City. So the plane is taxiing to the gate. Got it? The plane is taxiing to the gate. I've only got 15 minutes to get off the plane, get to baggage claim, get my luggage, and get out to the curb to catch a taxi or shuttle bus in order to get to my speech on time. Now, my seat is in the back of the plane, row 28, window seat. And the plane finally stops moving. And ding! You know, the sound that says you can get out of your seat and everyone in front of me rushes into the aisle. They get up and they start filling in the aisle and getting their luggage and then tick, tick, tick. I'm looking at my watch and my time is running out and no one is moving. No one moves forever. And I'm freaking out. Come on, people move. Okay, so that's the scene, right? Now, here's the thing the flight simulation proof. Later on after my speech at the reception or out in the hallway, people come up to me all excited and agitated. And they tell me how they were there in the aisle of the plane, stuck behind all of those stupid people who wouldn't move. Now, how about you just now? Did you see it, feel it and experience it? The plane, the aisle, all those people, the time running out, did you see it? Did you feel it, the anxiety? The question then is, What's going on with these people's brains, my audience members' brains while I'm telling my story? Why are they agitated as if they were on the plane? When they were calmly sitting in their chairs listening to my story, the blank looks on their faces. The technical neuroscience answer is called a mirror neuron response. Now listen to this. Marco Iacobani is a neuroscientist someone who studies the workings of the brain. In his book, and I love this book, Mirroring People, he asks, quote, why do we give ourselves over to emotion during the carefully crafted heart-rending scenes in certain movies? Because mirror neurons in our brains recreate for us the distress we see on the screen. We have empathy for the fictional characters. We know how they're feeling because we literally experience the same feelings ourselves. Mirror neurons. Now he goes on to say, vicarious is not a strong enough word to describe the effects of these mirror neurons. When we see someone actually suffering or in pain, mirror neurons help us read his or her facial expressions and actually make us feel the suffering or the pain of the other person, end quote. 
Well, Eureka, there's your scientific explanation, mirror neurons, synapses that fire in the brain when you or I are listening to a good story. Another expert, molecular biologist John Medina, explains this phenomenon in his book, Brain Rules. He writes, quote, when the brain detects an emotionally charged event, the amygdala releases dopamine into the system. Now, because dopamine greatly aids memory and information processing, you could say it creates a post-it note that reads, remember this, end quote. So in addition to the mere neurons that fire in our brains, we're also experiencing a chemical reaction, a dopamine dump. And because dopamine greatly aids memory and information processing, it not only makes your message memorable, it makes you memorable, which gives you an edge over your colleagues who deliver predictably boring PowerPoint presentations filled with facts and data and bullet points, but no stories, no context. It's your choice. Do you want to be captivating? or boring. Now let's talk about influence, the ability to influence someone to come over to your point of view, an essential skill if you're in leadership or sales. There's another incredible book from 2008, and it's titled Influencer, The Power to Change Anything. And the following quote helped me understand something that has been puzzling me for years, and it has to do with communication in relationship, specifically communication between people with different personalities and learning styles, yin people versus yang people, logical and linear thinkers versus creative and nonlinear thinkers. Here's the quote. Every time you try to convince others through verbal persuasion, you suffer from your inability to select and share language in a way that reproduces in the mind of the listener exactly the same thoughts that you are having. You say your words, but others hear their words, which in turn stimulate their images, their past histories, and their overall meaning, all of which may be very different from what you intended, end quote. Oh, man, there it is. The problem I've experienced when I say one thing and someone else interprets it in a way I hadn't intended. You say your words, but they hear their words. Yikes. Have you ever had that happen? It's annoying, isn't it? Now, he goes on to explain, quote, effective stories overcome this flaw. A well-told narrative provides concrete and vivid detail rather than terse summaries. It changes people's view of how the world works because it presents a plausible, touching, and memorable flow of cause and effect that can alter people's view of the consequences of various actions and beliefs. I want to read that again. It changes people's view of how the world works because it presents a plausible, touching, and memorable flow of cause and effect that can alter people's view of the consequences of various actions and beliefs. Man, that book is excellent. And once again, it's titled Influencer. And the authors are Carrie Patterson, Joseph Grenny, David Maxfield, Ron McMillan, and Al Switzler. Now, I'm another expert, Jennifer Aker, marketing professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. She's done her own research on the power of storytelling as a vehicle of influence and persuasion. She says, quote, Research shows our brains are not hardwired to understand logic or retain facts for very long. Our brains are wired to understand and retain stories. A story is a journey that moves the listener. And when the listener goes on that journey, they feel different. And the result is persuasion and sometimes action. Why do they feel different after hearing a story? because they went on a journey, a flight simulation. And during that journey, they had an experience of a new version of reality. Now, what does it mean for you? If you have too much content, too many wordy slides and facts and data and no stories, it means that you're gonna to fail to connect emotionally with your audience and most of your data fades away. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Facts fade, data gets dumped, but stories stick. Facts fade, data gets dumped, but stories stick. All of this wonderful research only goes to explain what good storytellers have known all along, that storytelling is a simple and effective way of having someone experience what you experienced without them having to go through the pain and difficulty you went through. 
they can learn the lesson you want them to learn quickly, right then and there, in the moment, because story illuminates parts of our brain that are only active when we actually experience something. All of this research and brain science, neuroscience, the mirror neurons and dopamine dumps explain why we understand the rich detail and action of a story and feel the emotion of the story in a more holistic and complex way than if we were simply processing pieces of information. Now, I'm not advocating for you to ditch all of your content, all of your facts and data, and just tell stories. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply making the point that stories create context for content. Start with a story that provides context for the content, facts and data to follow. But first, you got to engage them. You got to captivate them, pull their brains away from their preoccupation with emails and texts and the big and small distractions that they bring into the room before you speak. Hook them with a story, reel them in. Then, once you have their attention and you've used a story to create context, follow with the facts and data to support your position. Lead with a story follow with facts and data. And finally, in his book, Things That Make Us Smart, Don Norman says, stories are important cognitive events, for they encapsulate in one compact package, information, knowledge, context, and emotion. In other words, stories capture the big picture. So the next time you're preparing a high value presentation, look at the facts and data that you want to present and then go on a story safari and find the story, the metaphorical personal story that puts all your facts and data in context. And if you don't feel as if you have the tools you need to identify the right story and then to design it and craft it so that it works for you, go back and listen to the previous episodes of the podcast. There's some great, very, very specific content on how you choose, craft, and develop your stories. All right, that's it for this episode. What a blast, I love this. If you feel that you learned something valuable today, there are two things I'd like you to do. First, click on the follow or subscribe button, and second, Share this podcast with three people. Put it out on your social media. Help me spread the word about storytelling that sticks. As always, I'd love to hear from you with your questions and comments. Let me know that you're out there listening and learning. And if you want help with your stories, speeches, or TED Talks, please get in touch. Send an email to Doug at DougStevenson.com. Hey, thanks for listening. Until next episode, I'm Doug Stevenson.